All right, welcome to the OrthoClips podcast. Uh, this is Josh Luganbuehl. I'm here today with uh, Dr. Shannon Safir, Director of Sports Medicine at St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Today we're talking about patellar instability in uh, the pediatric population, decision-making, and management. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Safir. My pleasure. So let's get right into it. Um, so briefly describe, if you can, um, the stabilizers of the patella. Sure. So obviously this is a topic that uh, I discuss uh, quite frequently as it is something that presents to my office uh, quite frequently. So the patella um, obviously um, is a very important aspect of the knee and the most important stabilizer is the medial patellofemoral ligament, what we call the MPFL. So this attaches to the adductor tubicle and the medial patella of the border and provides anywhere from about 50 to 80% of their straining force to lateral displacement. So when someone dislocates their kneecap, it is almost a given that the MPFL is going to be torn. In order for the kneecap to uh, dislocate and end up lateral, uh, that medial stabilizer has to give way. Awesome. Um, And so someone presents to your office, you're concerned about a patellar dislocation what imaging studies are you routinely getting uh, for these for these dislocation patients? Well, first of all, I would say one of the most interesting things about a patellar dislocation is that it really presents almost identical to an ACL tear, um, and that's probably the best learning point. Um, the mechanism of injury is very similar to an ACL tear. It's usually a twisting injury with a foot planted. So. Um, uh, A lot of times when a patient comes in, they have a large uh, hemarthrosis, um, and the first thing I think about is, okay, am I dealing with an ACL tear or am I dealing with a patellar dislocation? Because again, they usually present with this mechanism of a twisting injury. Um, In order to kind of differentiate between the two, um, sometimes obviously they'll give you a hint that their knee dislocated. Now, obviously their knee did not dislocate, um, but what they felt or saw was the patella dislocate. Um, Typically, they'll also have tenderness along the medial aspect of the patella or the medial retinaculum. And really, um, probably most positive is the apprehension test. And that's where you uh, take your thumb or fingers and kind of push on the patella medially, trying to slide it laterally. Anybody that's dislocated is not going to like that. um, And they will immediately uh, try to stop you from doing that. And that's called the apprehension test. So certainly, if any of those are present, that gives me a high um, concern for it being uh, an MPFL tear and a patella dislocation. I think without question, you need to get an x-ray. Um, what I prefer to do is get an AP lateral and a merchant view. Um, some older studies talk about getting a sunrise view. The problem with the sunrise view is that's taking the knee at about 90 degrees. And by doing that, it basically eliminates that space uh, for you to evaluate um, the anatomy. And so by doing a merchant view, which is more of a 30 to 45 degree uh, view, uh, it opens it up. You can see if there's lateral tilt. Um, it allows better visualization to see any sort of osteochondral fracture and obviously to make sure that the fracture is reduced. So first and foremost, we get an x-ray. Um, and then what I'm really looking for, again, is the patella reduction, lateral tilt, and osteochondral fracture. And then I think um, it certainly is the standard to go ahead at that point and get an MRI. Now, are you getting an MRI for every injury you feel that patellar dislocation could have happened? So if I feel like it is a true patellar dislocation and, you know, we could differentiate between acute and chronic. So this is the individual who is a first-time dislocator. It was a traumatic event. They have a large hemarthrosis. Without question, it's a dislocation. Yes, I do think you need to get an MRI. And what I'm really looking for is not the MPFL, because again, we talked about before, the MPFL is likely torn. What I'm really looking for is to see if there's any other damage inside the knee, such such as an osteochondral fracture. So either off the medial patella facet or the lateral femoral condyle. Those are the most common uh, spots. If you have a chronic dislocator who comes in and they've dis- dislocated multiple times, you've already had a previous MRI, and for whatever reason you haven't operated on them uh, yet, that would be a patient you could consider not to do an MRI. But an acute dislocator, yes, I'm getting an MRI in all those individuals. Great. And then what situations would you consider getting a CAT scan, let's say? So um, 
really not uh, something uh, that I recommend doing. Um, we've had a couple of patients come from other facilities where it sounds like they get a CAT scan because it's something they can do almost immediately in the uh, ER. Um, however, you know, it's a lot of radiation, doesn't necessarily provide you with all the answers you need. Sometimes these osteochondral fractures are really purely cartilage, and so there's no bony involvement at all. So that may be difficult to see on the CAT scan. Um, and obviously you're looking for other intraarticular injuries. So uh, my go-to is the MRI, and certainly all of my partners on first-time dislocators get an MRI. Um, it, CAT scan is something that I don't uh, necessarily think uh, provides a lot of value. Great. Now describe how you approach the first time dislocator. What discussion are you having with the patient, the parents? How do you kind of navigate that situation? Sure. So obviously they come in, uh, we've decided that they've dislocated. Uh, typically they've, they're put into a knee immobilizer. I get an x-ray um, and then send them out for an MRI. So once they come back with the MRI, um, they've likely now been in the knee immobilizer uh, one to three weeks and we'll analyze the MRI. Again, not looking for the MPFL because my um, uh, thought process here is that's likely torn, but what I'm really looking for is everything else. So is there an osteochondral fracture is probably first and foremost. And again, I'm looking at uh, usually coming off of the medial patella facet or a lateral femoral condyle. If there is and there's a loose body, um, that is something that's going to push me more towards, sur uh, towards surgery. I'm also looking at uh, different anatomies. So I'm looking at trochlear dysplasia. I'm obviously seeing if they're scoutally immature or mature um, and any other factors that may contribute uh, to their dislocation. The talk that I have with the family in an acute dislocator uh, that has no osteochondral fracture and normal anatomy is I talk to them about the fact that they are at high risk for a re-dislocation. However, um, despite that high risk, this is something that we can potentially treat conservatively. So if there's no osteochondral fracture, my usual treatment is a knee immobilizer for three weeks. After three weeks in a knee immobilizer, I get them started with rehab, so physical therapy, and I'm looking to improve range of motion, uh, strengthen the quads and the hamstrings. What I tell the family is, unfortunately, once you dislocate, you are at higher risk of dislocating. In fact, there are some studies, uh, older studies, that show that risk is uh, probably about 50%. Uh, more recent studies have showed the risk to be more in the 20 to 30% range, and that probably has to do with more aggressive physical therapy. What I have found in my uh, patient population is, if we get them started with aggressive PT, we can probably drop that uh, re-dislocation rate down to 20, 25%. Um, so it's not great, but much more palatable than 50%. Uh, so a first-time dislocator, no osteochondral fracture, this is someone that I will try to treat conservatively, but certainly warn the parents that a re-dislocation is possible. Yeah, that sounds very, uh, very reasonable. Um, say you proceed with surgery, what are your goals um, during that? So certainly in regards to surgery, you know, if they presented and they had an osteochondral fracture, that is someone I would recommend surgery. And also if someone re-dislocates. So in my world, two strikes, you're out. So if they present with a second dislocation, now all of a sudden that risk of a re-dislocation jumps up to about 85%. And if you dislocate three times, it jumps up to 100%. So if I have a dislocator present with two dislocations, um, despite osteochondral fracture or not, that's someone I would recommend surgery. And certainly a first time dislocator with an osteochondral fracture, um, I would recommend surgery. So my go-to surgery um, in someone that has normal anatomic alignment is an MPFL reconstruction. And there's basically two goals of surgery. The first goal is to take care of any damage that's been done. And the second goal is to prevent it from happening again. So in regards of taking care of any damage that's been done, if they have an osteochondral fracture, that's something either that I excise or fix. Um, and if there's any other cartilage damage, um, we would uh, correct that as well. Uh, in regards to preventing it from happening again, that's where I do the MPFL reconstruction. Uh, whether they are scoutally mature or scoutally immature, uh, we have different techniques that we can use to tether the kneecap and recreate the medial patellofemoral ligament uh, so that they have a, a low incidence of re-dislocation. Awesome. And, you know, there are multiple procedures for these patellar instability cases. How do you decide to do a bony procedure in combination? 
So uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it. So one I just kind of mentioned briefly before is this idea, idea of anatomic alignment. So um, certainly it makes sense on anybody that you're going to operate on uh, probably to get a standing x-ray uh, AP hip to ankle. And what you're looking for, obviously, is is there increased Q angle, um, you know, is there increased femoral tibial valgus, external tibial torsion, patella alta, um, and then by exam, you know, do they have generalized ligamentous uh, laxity, and certainly by the MRI, do they have any sort of uh, trochlea uh, or femoral condylar uh, dysplasia? So all those factors obviously uh, need to be um, uh, thought about, um, and then also whether they're scholarly mature or immature. So an immature individual, uh, you're somewhat limited in the bony procedures that you can perform. Now, if they obviously have very significant valgus, um, you could do uh, either an osteotomy or some sort of growth modulation to get them out of valgus uh, in addition to an MPFL reconstruction, uh, but to do any sort of um, uh, tibia tubical osteotomy or anything uh, that would get close to the growth plate, that is something you would wait on. Um, so again, I kind of look at all these different factors. Um, I would say that the MPFL is kind of my go-to. It's kind of my workhorse. Um, but certainly um, when I get an MRI, I'm looking at the uh, patella numbers. I'm looking at my uh, 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 trochlea uh, to, sorry, my uh, uh, TT to TG uh, distance um, to make sure that that is not above 20. Um, and again, by analyzing all those factors, I can make the decision whether or not I can proceed with just a soft tissue reconstruction uh, versus um, a combination of both. Awesome. Now, for your standard MPFL reconstruction, how do you counsel the patient uh, postoperatively? When are they typically back to activity, sports, uh, things of that nature? So what I tell all my patients is this is probably my uh, favorite surgery to do. And the reason why is because of how well they do. Most of these patients, particularly your chronic dislocators, live in fear of it re-dislocating. Um, <clears throat> I can only imagine uh, you know, playing sports and activities with the uh, fear that your kneecap could pop out at any point uh, during that game. It, it must be difficult to, uh, to play. Um, so they see the difference almost immediately. Um, when I see them back in the office after the operation and I go to uh, move the kneecap, they uh, almost to a patient lose that patella apprehension because they immediately realize the stability of the kneecap. So my post-op protocol is for three weeks, I do have them in a knee immobilizer um, and non-weight bearing. Um, I do allow range of motion, so they open the knee immobilizer, they're able to do range of motion zero to 45 degrees, and they do that daily. Um, also in the knee immobilizer, they do leg raises, and that's basically to keep the quad muscle active. After three weeks, we uh, get them out of the knee immobilizer, put them into a patellar stabilizer brace, let them start walking on it, start moving it, and get started with physical therapy. At eight weeks, we increase physical therapy to start uh, including jogging and running, and then over the next couple, uh, couple of weeks, progress them to cutting and jumping, and the usual time period is three months uh, back to uh, sports and activities. Awesome. Well, I think that just about covers it all. Uh, thank you for joining us today and talking with us. Thank you very much. All right. Stay tuned for another episode of OrthoClips in the near future.